Hi, this video is in response to some of the confusion it looks like some of you are having with uh, completing the ANOVA table. Um, and basically what you're trying to do here is just calculate an F ratio. And you're given some of the values and some of the other values you'll have to actually calculate. Uh, and also, once you've calculated your F ratio, we'll then be able to um, match that up with its associated p-value, or at least estimate what its p-value will be using the tables in the back of the book. So I'll, I'll walk through this um, step by step. So just as kind of a reminder, when we're calculating an F ratio, the formula that we're using um, is the mean square between divided by the mean square within. Um, so how we get the mean square between is we have the sum of squares between divided by the degrees of freedom between. Remember, sum of squares is basically looking at the difference um, between different groups, squaring that difference, and then summing all of those differences between group 1 versus group 2 versus group 3 and so on. And then our degrees of freedom between is basically the number of groups minus 2, or minus 1, excuse me. Um, now the mean square within formula is the sums of squares within, which is basically the variance within um, a group among its subjects. And again, we're looking at the difference among each of the group members in group one, for example. We, we see that difference, we square it, and then we sum the differences. And then degrees of freedom within is basically all of the subjects minus the number of, of groups that we have to get the degrees of freedom. Okay, so using, knowing those formulas and using those formulas is how we basically would then fill in this table. So the first one is somewhat tricky in the sense that it's asking you to do a little bit of arithmetic outside of what you might be prepared to do. But we need to first figure out the sum of squares between. Well, we know the total sum of squares, and then we can just subtract the within group sum of squares from the total. Let me pull up my calculator here and we'll do that quickly. So we've got um, 109.7. Uh, minus 12.3. So the sum of squares between then will be 97.4. Okay, so now we have everything we need to then further calculate the rest of the table. So we've got our sum of squares, we have our degrees of freedom, so now we need to calculate mean squares and then the F ratio and then we'll figure out the p-value. So let's do the mean square between first of all, which again is the sum of squares between divided by the degrees of freedom between. So that's basically 97.4 divided by 2. So 97.4 divided by 2 equals 48.7. Okay, now we do a very a similar function here. We've got our degrees of freedom, um, or sum of squares within, and then our degrees of freedom within. We're going to divide 62 into 12.3, and that will give us our mean square within. So we take, uh, so let's clear this. We've got 12.3 divided by 62 equals 0.198. Okay, now the last step to get the F ratio is now again we go back to our original formula. We've got the mean square between, which is this 48.7 number divided by the mean square within, which is this 0.198 number. We divide 0.198 into 48.7 and that will give us our F ratio. So we've got 48.7 divided by 0.198. That gives, gives us a very large F ratio of 245. Okay, now in order to get the p-value, what we have to do is go back to our tables in the back of the book. And so this is going to be a somewhat kind of a trial and error process. And I can't show you this on the screen, obviously, but I can kind of talk my way through this. So what I want to try and do is go to our uh, critical value of F table, which is table E in your textbook, um, E for Eric, um, page 393. And so what we've got to do is we've got to find our degrees of freedom, we're going to go to the table and then see if we can find our F value and then see which table that is in. So in other words, is it, is it in the 0.05 table? Is it in the 0.01 table? And so on. And then I'll give us some idea of the p-value associated with that F score. And 
And a rule of thumb, because that is such a large F score, that's a huge F score, you know it's going to be at least less than 0.01 because that is a very large F score. So that gives you some idea of the estimation of what the p-value will be. So just to, to make that process a little bit easier, I'm going to go to a portion of the table that is labeled uh, 0.01 two-tailed test, which is on page 395. I'm going to find my degrees of freedom between and within of 2 and 62. In this case, 62 isn't an option um, on the column for degrees of freedom within. So I'm going to go with degrees of freedom between of 2 and degrees of freedom within of 60. And the F score associated with that level, 0.01, is 4.98. Now our F ratio is much larger than that. So we know the P value is going to be much smaller than 0.01. So we go to the next table on page 396. We go back to our degrees of freedom of 2 and 60. And the F score associated with that degrees of freedom and that P value is 7.76. Now again, our F ratio is much larger than 7.76. So we know that the P value associated with this F score is going to be less than at least 0.001. Okay, and it's probably going to be more in the neighborhood of 0.00001 or less. So it's a very large F score, so it's a very small p value associated with it. So this would be an acceptable answer as far as coming up with the p value associated with that F score. Now, some of you got a little confused about the, the idea that you get to choose your p value. Well, that's only when, we're, when you're setting a criteria for your hypothesis decision. So when we choose our critical value of F, in order to do that, we're choosing what p-value we want to test the hypothesis. That's a little bit different. This is actually doing the F-score uh, test, coming up with an F-ratio or F-score, and then coming up with the p-value associated with it. So if we had an hypothesis testing criteria of 0.05 or less, then this obviously would exceed that or go beyond that, and so we'd reject the null hypothesis. So there's a little bit of a difference between choosing your p-value in order to make a hypothesis testing criteria versus calculating your p-value in order to then apply that hypothesis testing criteria. So hopefully that helped a little bit as far as understanding how to do this. Again, this is typically not something we're going to do on a regular basis, calculate F ratios by hand. But at least you can see where these numbers are coming from and how we get to the end product. So this F ratio, what it's really telling us is how much variance there is between groups. In other words, the effect of the treatment. And then it's also telling us how much variance is within the groups. In other words, air how much individual variation is there, how much measurement error is there, or how much experimental error there might be. And then so once we have that F ratio, it gives us an understanding of that. So the larger the mean square between and the smaller the mean square within, then we're going to have a very large F score. And that's good. That means we're, we're getting a very strong signal or an idea of the treatment effect, and we have very little error that's getting in the way. Now, if we had a lot, if we had a you know a moderate size mean square between number and we had a moderate size mean square within number, then an F score would be close to one. And that means we're not able to see, if there is one, the true treatment effect. So that could mean either there's too much air for us to really see the treatment effect, or the treatment really isn't effective if we've got an F score close to one. So that that's how we do this. And if you've got any more questions, go ahead and, and post to the forum um, so we can get this uh, clarified.